Good afternoon. I want to begin the service uh, today by reminding you of what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He said, the time of my departure is at hand. I have kept the faith, has run the race. Now there is laid up for me a crown of glory, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give not only to me, but to all of those who long for his appearing. This week, we had two of our dear members that we've all been praying for to depart this life, the time of their departure, their exodus has come. So Dennis Dorman died and Marilyn Pfeiffer died. We'll have both their funerals this week, one Wednesday and one Friday. So our congregation is grieving the Lord said that we grieve not as those who have no hope. That's not the problem. We have every hope. We have every reason to believe that those who confess Christ see him face to face. But I grieve because I've lost friends and I see those I love grieving for them. And sometimes that hurts as much as anything in the whole process. So as the apostle says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. He also says in 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy, excuse me, that, the, that our blessed Savior Jesus Christ has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So we bury each other, not as those who have no hope, not as pagans, for we know that Christ died and was raised again, and all who love him will also be raised again. As Jesus said, of all those whom the Father has given me, I will lose none. So pray for the families of Dennis Dorman and Marilyn Pfeiffer. Let's pray right now. Lord, it has been your good pleasure to give us these people for decades. And now you have taken them to yourself, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow after them. Lord, teach us to number our days, for our day too is coming. Let us not be found unawares or shocked and surprised, but let us be found in faith, not having our own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness of of Christ, even the righteousness which is by faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, be merciful to us. As you see, we are only flesh and blood, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In our worship service this coming Sunday, we will begin singing the gathering song, Come, Let Us Praise the Lord. That's the purpose of worship, ultimately. It's not to hear a good sermon, though I hope you do. It's not just to sing, but it is to bring praise to God, who has given us another week. Sunday is the first day of the week, so we want to begin our worship of God on the first day of the week. Set the tone right. Monday is not the first day of the week. Sunday, the Christian Sabbath, is the first day, and we set the tone with worship. Then we'll have the call to worship spoken. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with greatness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord, or Jehovah, is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For Jehovah is good, and his love endures forever. Its faithfulness continues to all generations. Then while we remain standing, we will sing, The Lord is my shepherd, taken from Psalm 23. And remain standing for the invocation and the Lord's prayer. So let us do that now. Come quickly, Holy Spirit. Fill us that we may worship aright. Quiet our minds, our troubled spirits, and remind us that you have always been in control and always will be, 
and you do all things well. So teach us to worship and fill us with faith, hope, and love, these three great gifts that endure forever. For we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Then we will sing in response well, in response to, to God's grace and the Lord's Prayer, we'll have the first two scripture readings from Psalm 19, a marvelous psalm, and Isaiah 54 through 9a, which we read responsively. Then we will stand and sing the glory of Patri, glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, in response to the hearing of God's word. Then we remaining standing will sing our second hymn, our third hymn, excuse me, how great thou art. Everybody loves that one because it is a magnificent, uplifting hymn, celebrating the attributes of God. Then we'll bring our presentation of tithes and offerings. God has taught us that we ought not worship empty handed, but we bring the substance of our life, something you exchanged your life for that you cannot get back. And that is money. We have exchanged our time, our talents, for money. And giving money is therefore very important. It doesn't reach the spirit of men, but God uses it to reach the spirit of men. Let us pray and dedicate our offerings. Lord, if we do not give you our hearts first, then whatever else we bring is meaningless. So we receive from our hand that which you gave us strength to earn, and use it for the glory of Christ, in whose name we ask it. Amen. Then we will sing the doxology. We sing a lot of historical hymns, a lot of historical elements of worship, because we're not trying to be novel. We're not trying to be new and fresh. We belong to the ancient church, the church through the centuries that has praised God in an orderly fashion and has used the creeds and the hymns and the scripture readings to express ourselves and express our faith. So if you come to our church, you're, you're not going to come to rock and roll. You're going to come and worship the Lord. You may be still for a season, but you will certainly stand and sing mightily the wonderful hymns that God has given as gifts to the church. We are reverent, we're not st stuffy, we laugh, but we know we've come to worship God and he is the audience, not the preacher and not the people in the congregation. God is the one who is listening. So after the doxology, we'll have two more scripture readings from James chapter 3 verses 1 through 12 and Mark 8, 27 through 38. And the title of the sermon is taken really out of Mark 8's text, Finding Life in Christ Alone. No one can ever accuse Jesus of recruiting followers under false pretenses by watering down the cost. Jesus always tells us to count the cost if you would be his disciples. There will be one to pay. Many will suffer if they choose him over the world. There is an unavoidable price to be paid. The scripture says all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. All of them. Jesus never lured people to him with the promise of an easy way. Today, the promise of an easy way is all too common in modern evangelical faith. The expressions of it are come down to follow Jesus and prosper in both this world and in the next. Jesus is the key to prosperity. 
We don't believe that because God will cause his children to suffer the loss of all things many times. He has often done so through history. So it's a false gospel to ask people to come because your life will be made a whole lot easier, even richer, and always healthier. No, that is not the call of Jesus. Jesus' call is a call to pay a price as well as to gain something you cannot lose. Our Lord Jesus lays down three imperatives in Mark 8. It's in uh, Matthew 16, 21 to 28. I don't know why I had Matthew uh, Mark on the brain. But Matthew 16, 21 to 28. These are the terms to follow Christ. These are three non-negotiables for anyone who wants to be his disciple. Three imperatives. And the first non-negotiable is that you must deny yourself. Say farewell to the right to make independent decisions about your life. Say farewell to the idea that you can be good enough to earn eternal life. Say farewell to do whatever you will to do. You must say no to yourself in order to say yes to Jesus Christ. This is the opposite of the idea that all you have and all you possess really belongs to you. My body, my choice. My soul, my choice. My money, my choice. My, 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 my. You cannot be the disciple of Jesus if my is your central concern. Jesus destroyed that, that idea when he said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? Until you deny yourself, you will never accept the second imperative in just a moment, which is to take up your cross. When Jesus was in Gethsemane, he prayed with all his might that the cup of death by means of the cross and his bearing the wrath of the Father for the sins of man might be taken from him. That was his wish. Then he added, but not my will be done, but yours. He denied his own will. He denied himself. And he took up the cross that the Father had assigned to him. Everyone who takes Jesus as Lord must also say, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And that is the first non-negotiable, the first imperative. Every day, you must say no to yourself and yes to Christ. Then there's a second imperative, and that is that you must take up your cross. First deny yourself, then take up your cross. When Jesus spoke these words, the cross was first and last a place where men died a terrible death. The cross was the instrument of cruel death visited on the worst of criminals. When Jesus spoke these words, he had not yet been crucified, but the public spectacle of condemned men carrying their own crosses to the hill of execution was very familiar to everyone. No one then wore a cross of gold around his neck, nor a cross dangling from the front of his chariot. It was not emblazoned on their shirts and tattooed in their arms and foreheads. No cross, uh, no, no cross earrings dangled from the earlobes of Christian women. To die on the cross was a shame. Jesus was crucified between two criminals on the hill of public execution. Now, Jesus says to his band of merry men, if you want to follow me, you must voluntarily shoulder whatever misery comes your way due to your belonging to me. To carry a cross means the conscious carrying of the scorn that comes from proclaiming Jesus as Lord of all life, who is raised from the dead on the third day. You have to own that you died with Christ. And now the life you live belongs to Jesus. And you have to do it publicly. 
No one was ever crucified in the dead of night in private. Crucifixions took place in broad daylight so everybody could see the fate of a criminal. It took place before the world. You have to die publicly to self and willingly carry your own cross if you would follow Jesus. I will well remember a 16-year-old boy in a youth group once in North Carolina where I was, and his mother said to me one day, I don't know what to do. I guess Tommy is my cross to bear. I wanted to say, but I didn't. No, Tommy is a juvenile delinquent headed for incarceration, but Tommy isn't your cross. The cross is where you die to yourself in order to receive Jesus. Galatians 2.20, Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. What does he principally mean? He means that he bets his life on trusting in Jesus' blood and righteousness and comes to the throne of grace alone for salvation. Deny yourself, the first imperative. Take up your cross, the second imperative. The second non-negotiable, if you would follow Jesus. And then there's a third non-negotiable. Follow me. Deny yourself. Take up your cross, follow me. Unless the first two are done, you will never make it to the third one anyway. So Jesus quickly then will deliver four incentives for you to deny yourself, to take up your cross, and to follow him. The first incentive is found in Matthew 16, 25. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever will lose his life for me will save it. I want life, don't you? So I will follow Christ by faith each day, striving to live according to his will. That's the first incentive. Whoever saves his life loses it, but if you lose it for my sake, you will gain it. And then there's a second incentive he gives for denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following him. That's verse 26 gaining all the physical assets of the world and losing your soul to eternity is a fool's errand. What if you gain the whole world and you lose your own soul? That is an incentive. What good will it be for a man, Jesus says, if he gains the world? He will not follow Christ because of his love. He who will not follow Christ because of his love for the world will in the end find he loses his most precious possession, his soul. Dennis and Marilyn have departed from their bodies. But that is not the end of them. Their souls have gone to, to be immediately with God. And they wait for the return of our Lord Jesus when the trumpet will sound and the graves will open and the sea will give up its dead and those souls of believers will be reunited with their bodies now made immortal, changed forever, body and soul. But what of those who have not trusted Christ, who have not loved him? They will be reunited with their bodies too. But now both body and soul will be cast in the fire that never goes out, Jesus says. The lake that burns forever, prepared for the devil and his angels. They will also join them there. What if you gain the whole world and yet you lose your soul? If a man chooses profits over the approval of God, if he chooses the lauding of other men for him, if he chooses pride over following Christ, he's made a fatal mistake. And all he lives for would bring him no comfort on the day of judgment. If a man chooses anything over allegiance to Jesus, whatever he has chosen will be a curse to him on the day of judgment. 
And then he gives a third incentive. For what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Not only what can he gain, but what could he use to buy it? You cannot ransom your soul with anything you can acquire in this world. Only Christ, through his sacrifice for sins, can ransom your soul. To lose your soul is the most tragic loss that can be experienced. For the loss is eternal. There is no redemption ever once lost. So the incentive to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus is the certainty of your ransom by the obedience of Jesus Christ. That's an incentive. As I was uh, with these families in the death of their loved ones, I put myself in there and I say, it won't be too much longer, I'm 74, before perhaps my family will gather around and I will be unconscious. All the believing to be done is done. All the doing well for the Lord, all the prayers, all of that is done for me. I'm unconscious and gone till they pull the plug. It will come if God grants me that kind of death. But either way, I will stand before him at the judgment bar of God. And I want to know that I am ransomed by the obedience of Jesus Christ, not by something I thought I could gain. And then there's a fourth incentive in verse 27. Jesus says, For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. Then he will reward each person according to what he has done. To serve Jesus by denying self, taking up my cross, and following him, is to invest in a glorious future that will last for an eternity in the loving presence of Jesus. I want to make that investment. I am making that investment. I have been making making that investment since I was 10 years old. I am following Christ all the way into glory. That is the promise of the Savior, and the promise cannot be broken. So in conclusion, our Savior sets out the universal terms for being his disciple. In Mark 8 and in the parallel passage in Matthew 16 that I am using, first of all, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. Nothing short of that will gain you in Christ as your Lord and Master. And then think of the four incentives to do this. By following him, you will experience life as it is meant to be lived. Second, by following him, you will gain what has eternal value, your soul. The third incentive, by following him, you will be ransomed, body and soul, eternally. And the fourth incentive, to follow Jesus, is that by following him, you will invest in the most glorious eternal future, in the loving presence of Jesus himself. So, as Matthew records and Mark says and Luke also, what will you choose? Let us pray. Almighty God, give us the wisdom to see beyond the things of this life that are so temporary that we may lay up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupts and thieves do not break through and steal, eternal in the heavens, an inheritance given by you and held for us. Lord, be merciful to all who have decisions to make this day, life and death decisions, maybe decisions about other people's lives, but certainly about their own. Call them irresistibly by your Holy Spirit that they may deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow you. Lord Jesus, hear us for your name's sake. Amen. After the sermon, we will stand and sing, It is well with my soul. Is it well with your soul? If it isn't, all you need do is totally surrender to the Lord. All you are and all you have and all you know about yourself right now, just say it to him and mean it. 
and the Holy Spirit is leading you to do that if you do. And you will be forever part of the kingdom family of Jesus Christ. Then we will have after the song, the responsive litany, which we will read now. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we had confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as is the manner of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Receive the benediction or the good word from the word of the Lord. Now may the grace, mercy, and peace of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Spirit rest and abide upon all those who love him in sincerity for Jesus' sake. Amen.